Welcome to the Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Hello, Patrick Dunno here, news editor with the Irish Farmers Journal. Following his election last week, IFA President Joe Healy gave his inaugural speech to the Association's AGM in Dublin this Wednesday. Here are the priorities he set out for himself and the IFA. Members have been let down by failures in transparency, governance and decision making. Farmers need a strong IFA, a strong IFA to fight for viable farm incomes. We must resolve the structural failures that eventually led to the events of the recent months. Trust, transparency and credibility has to be at the heart of the IFA going forward. With the farm income challenge in every sector, farmers need a strong and adequately supported IFA to fight their cause. The Lucy report outlined a number of recommendations. IFA governance will be strengthened. Transparency will be maximised. Our full financial accounts will be placed before the AGM every year and put on the IFA website for all members. The Renumeration Committee will set the payment levels for the President and new Director General and these will be made public. Neither the President nor the Director General will sit on that committee. I will start the process for the appointment of a new Director General and a review of the levy immediately. I'm taking two initiatives to strengthen representation and I acknowledge what has been said here already in relation to other committees and these will be also reviewed. But I propose to re-establish the National Animal Health Committee with a broad brief to cover all areas of animal health and welfare. (laughs) All counties will be represented and the chairman will have a full seat on council. I also propose to set up a national committee combining Hill and all other designated areas with this chairman also having a full seat on National Council. (laughs) IFA will continue to push for stronger legislation to include an independent ombudsman and a ban on below cost selling. In Brussels, the Irish government must support the commission proposal that all large multinationals, including retailers and processors, will be obliged to publish their profits in each member state. On costs and inputs, high inputs are also a major problem. The cartel on fertiliser prices and the stranglehold of the banks on interest rates has to be broken. Delivering direct payments on time is critically important. While acknowledging that most payments have been delivered within the deadlines over the past year, there were some unacceptable delays adding huge pressure on farmers. Delays will not be tolerated this year. This is a red line for the IFA and the Minister for Agriculture. IFA has retained a competition economist to examine the proposed ABP investment in Slaney. We'll be making a strong case to the government and the competition's authority in both Brussels and Dublin that effective competition in the beef sector is essential. We also require a strong live export trade. We need to see stock flowing to the likes of Turkey and Egypt. The new government must also resolve the labelling issues which are preventing us from maximising the potential of the live trade with Northern Ireland and Britain. IFA is totally opposed to carcass weight restrictions. Weights were never part of the QPS. These are being used to cut prices to our best quality stock from the suckler herd and would cost Irish farmers over 10 million per year. Dairy farmers are in a prolonged period of extremely low prices and reduced income. 
the dairy industry cannot plan for a future based on farmers carrying most of the market risk. Co-ops require farmers to sign milk contract agreements. In return, they must give stronger direction on the volume the market can support at a viable price. The co-ops has to stop cutting milk price. Here, here, here. Grain farmers are facing into their fourth difficult year with prices totally out of line with the reality of fertilizers, chemicals, machinery and land rental costs. <coughs> Three years of falling prices <coughs> left growers last year except a price of less than 140 euros per ton. 25 years ago, they were get, farmers were getting much more than this. Even 40 years ago, they were getting much more than this. With 6.5 million livestock, 1.5 million pigs, and over 12 million poultry, our agriculture sector consumes over 5 million tonnes of grain annually, of which we produce about half. We need a vibrant tillage farming sector in Ireland. Here, here. We're making progress on the IFA campaign for a targeted payment of 20 euro per breeding yo, with commitments from both of the political parties. The new government must now deliver on those commitments. In 2016, IFA will have a strong focus on hill farming and pursue flexible implementation of common edge stocking rules, a Borbia marketing initiative for hill lambs, implementation of the proposed extension to the burning dates, and expansion of the walks scheme. Pig farmers are also enduring a severe income crisis. <coughs> IFA is seeking the establishment of a pig meat forum, chaired by the Minister, which will map out a sustainable and long-term strategy for the pig sector. The Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. My colleague Pat O'Toole attended the second sale of animals from the Creighton Hill herd in County Cork on Monday. He told the Irish Farmers Journal's digital editor Thomas Hubert what he saw as the auctioneer dispersed the herd on behalf of the sheriff and the bank ACC Loan Management. The Creighton Hill farm is very well known, especially among Holstein breeders. Uh, one of the finest pedigree Holstein herds in the country, uh, internationally renowned. Peter Kingston is the owner of the farm. He got into financial difficulty and ACC Loan Management obtained a judgment in 2015 of 2.4 million against the family. Uh, on the instructions of the creditors, uh, the sheriff took over the farm uh, late last year and took possession of not just the land but the herd. And uh, on her instructions, the herd was auctioned two weeks ago. Um, we thought that would be the end of the matter. But uh, it emerged the following Friday evening that up to 500 of the 950 animals sold were going back on the market because payment had not been completed by the deadline imposed. It later transpired that the vast majority of these animals had either been bought by George Kingston, uh, Peter's father, the man who originally established the Graydon Hill Herd when he bought the farm uh, at Noville, just outside Cork, back in the 1970s. He'd either bought the animals himself or they'd been bought on his behalf. Unfortunately, George Kingston wasn't able to free up the funds in time to make payment, and so they came back on the market. So a fraught situation became pretty chaotic, with uh, press releases and insults being exchanged between the sides and high court visits by the sheriff to prevent the Land League from uh, protesting at the auction. Um, so last Monday we had the second auction. Security was very tight. Access was restricted, uh, you had to bring identification having pre-booked and you had to lodge €5,000 bond to show that you were serious about buying um, and indeed those present, uh, while limited in number, were serious about buying. There was about 40 people present on the day once you got inside, the atmosphere was quite businesslike. You couldn't call it normal, it, it was surreal to be in the yard of George Kingston and Peter Kingston um, while their life's work was being uh, stripped away uh, and dispersed around the country and indeed abroad. 
Who would be a, a buyer at this kind of sale? Was there anybody local or was it seen as uh, maybe something you shouldn't do if you are from the locality? There didn't seem to be a huge local presence, but that may not just be because of reticence uh, out of respect for the Kingston family, although that could well have been an element. And uh, certainly at the first sale, um, it, it seems now that when George Kingston or someone on his behalf was bidding on animals, uh, there wasn't much competition to him because uh, the prices received for the same animals only two weeks later at the second sale were much higher, uh, up to 50% higher on average, I would think. Uh, but the other factor is that these are very high genetic merit animals. They're high input, high output animals, high cost. And it's a far cry from what we could call the Moor Park model of grass-based, low-cost uh, dairy farming, which has become, I suppose, the, the norm in Ireland now. Um, there was significant interest from Northern Ireland and a lot of the animals are likely to have crossed the border. Sterling has appreciated against the euro in the two weeks between the two auctions, but it, the animal type would be more sought after in Northern Ireland. And it could well be there were some internet uh, buying as well as, as uh, people who are present buying. It seemed to be a, a very small proportion uh, although the facilities and resources were there and the auction was being streamed online, it seemed a vast majority of the part buying was being done uh, by those present. Um, and as I say, quite a quite a significant proportion of animals going north. Now, there has been, as you said, a higher level of price achieved this time, some money uh, coming into the coffers of the sheriff on behalf of the creditors. Any hope of recouping the debt incurred by the Kingston family, whether to their bank that's taking this action or to other creditors who also owed money? Well, as I say, 2.45 million is owed to the primary creditor. The other primary creditor is always revenue. If there's anything owed to revenue, they're first in line. We don't know that situation. But... I would be concerned for secondary creditors, and there are a significant number of them. I met a number of them prior to the original auction. Uh, the normal people who trade with any farmer, uh, whether it's the AI man or the oil man or the silage contractor, and uh, these people had huge concerns that they would never see a penny. The big problem, I mean, you're talking about significant assets, and uh, the auction will have brought in a lot of money, well over two quarts of a million, I would think, in total, perhaps more. And uh, in addition to that, you have to add on the uh, value of the farm. It's 170 acres, 64-unit rotary parlour, a two-acre shed, which can, is capable of housing up to 1,000 animals. Uh, a significant holding. But the sheriff has incurred huge costs. She's been running the herd since late last year. There's been visits to the high court. There's been a high level of security, up to 30 people protecting the farm, as well as the operatives employed to maintain the herd. In excess of, well in excess of a million euros has been spent by the sheriff. And then there's the legal cost that the bank has incurred. Uh, when you put all that together, it's likely that there won't be much left for anyone. And it seems that in cases like this, that the, the banks decide that where someone is being uncooperative, they decide to make an example to maybe keep other creditors in line. And uh, I think a lot of farm families will have been watching with concern. So is this just an example and a case that's totally out of the ordinary? Or are we likely to see similar cases elsewhere? Because after all, this is not the only farm that has heavy debts and may have trouble paying back. Uh, farm debts are widespread. And the ability of people to pay their debts at the moment with uh, dairy prices being low, grain prices being low, uh, those high borrowed sectors are, are going to have real difficulty maintaining payments in the short term. But of course farming is a long term business. Uh, there are two categories of farms that there's significant concern about. One is those that bought land at the height of the boom and who are effectively in negative equity because land has uh, dramatically reduced in price. Um, however, land does have a residual value and if those people have had a good track or record of repayment and are engaging with the banks, the hope would be that a, a settlement can be agreed. Uh, the other sector are those, the best farmers really in many cases, who were encouraged at the height of the boom to sweat their assets, uh, that was the popular phrase, where they leveraged the farm value. Uh, to borrow money to invest off farm either for property or share investment typically um, those investments have tanked and farmers are now faced with uh, huge repayments and uh, limited resources other than their farm and again there's concern 
it's unlikely that this is the last high profile auction we will see but hopefully we won't see too many as controversial as this one as fraught as damaging or with as much pain inflicted Okay, thank you, Pat. You have coverage of this uh, last sale in this week's Irish Farmers Journal, and we have the backstory in our archives at farmersjournal.ie. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Find out more at farmersjournal.ie. Earlier this week, the Irish Farmers Journal's market specialist, Phil O'Neill, was touring China and Japan with Phil Hogan. He asked the European Agriculture Commissioner what he had achieved during the visit and what farmers could expect from the trade mission. Well, speaking to the companies that uh, have been in Japan and China, they have done business. And uh, we have provided an opportunity for business-to-business meetings for, to help companies in the way that we do under our promotion schemes to unlock the potential for many commodity areas. And business executives that I've been speaking to uh, in the last few days seem to be very happy with the context they've made, but also they're doing business, which is great. It's also, I suppose, very timely that you conclude this mission in Japan. And I know you have a series of meetings involving, indeed, the Japanese Minister for Agriculture. Particularly timely, given that we're currently involved in a free trade discussion with Japan. One probably of the less focused on the European context, and one with considerable potential for Europe. Yes, I'm giving a lot of priority to the agricultural dimension of the EU-Japan free trade agreement. It's where we have great opportunity for to open new markets for our commodity areas, particularly in the ones that are under pressure, like dairy products and pig meat products. So we have been uh, having good interaction with uh, uh, the Japanese ministers and Japanese businesses. At the moment, they are facing elections in July, and as you know, very little movement happens in the close run into an election. So I expect in the autumn that the discussions will intensify, and I hope that we can meet a target of reaching a deal in 2016. People that would have some knowledge of the TPP discussions, the Pacific ones that are currently going through approval and ratification in Japan at the moment, would say that that was very defensive on agriculture, that they didn't gain much there. Many of the tougher issues on agriculture have been pushed away down the road. Will it be any different for Europe, do you think? The European Union sees a, 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 an FTA with Japan as much different than TPP. We don't see or we don't use the TPP temp- as a template for the negotiations with Japan. We have a lot more we can offer in terms of non-agricultural commodities uh, for the Japanese companies. But equally, in return for that, we, we feel that we have high-quality food products uh, and we have opportunities uh, in so many commodity areas that where the Japanese uh, consumer uh, and the are, are in deficit, uh, you know, particularly along the commodity areas of dairy, beef and pork. Okay, so you think that that Europe can actually offer Japan more on industrial type goods there, and there's something of an opportunity for agriculture that doesn't didn't really exist in TPP. Absolutely, we feel that we're on the offensive with Japan in relation to a free trade agreement, and uh, we of course there'll be some sensitive products like rice from the point of view of the Japanese, but we on the other hand have an opportunity to get good access to a population of 127 million people for dairy, pork, and beef. The other two trade agreements that are very much are in focus in Europe in the moment and are scaring the life out of Irish farmers is the possibility of a trade deal with Mercosur where we basically in Europe feel uh, in the agricultural industry there's nothing to be gained and TTIP with the United States. Can you give any assurance there to Irish and indeed European farmers that their interests will be protected or are they going to be sacrificed so that we can sell uh, our industrial products and our financial services to South America? Well, Mercosur talks have been going on for 15 years. I know that's got a recent uh, injection of pace uh, since Christmas, but I can assure you that the interests of the of, of the farmer in Europe and the interests of agriculture are certainly brought to the attention of the College of European Commissioners and our Trade Commissioners. They've been intensively discussed with the member states, and I think you know that we will see the offer that was being made by the European Union in the Mercosur talks would be very balanced in the context of agriculture. 78,000 tonnes of beef seem to be on the table at the moment. There's simply no way, surely, the European market could carry that. Well, let's see what the final offer would be. That's not the final offer. That's an indicative figure that has been put out there to the member states to see what the reaction would be. Not surprising there has been bad reaction from the agricultural point of view to that particular proposal. And it's been discussed by the Trade Policy Council and by agricultural ministers on a regular basis in recent weeks. And the final offer will certainly reflect in the commodity areas 
what we can absorb in the European Union at a difficult time in our markets. There seems to be a considerable momentum at EU level, certainly looking at it from the outside, in terms of getting deals concluded with Mercosur and indeed TTIP in the context of the US. Is there a danger that we get pushed into something that we simply cannot accommodate? No, the European Union is going to be certainly concentrating on substance over speed and the quality of the outcome and the balanced nature of the outcome across all of the various areas of economic activity will have to be taken into account. So I don't think anybody should wish to any conclusions that, uh, that any particular area is going to be sacrificed for the benefit of another. We will be vigilant about ensuring that we get a balanced outcome that will reflect the market situation in Europe at the moment, that will reflect the fact that these negotiations are going on for a considerable period of time going back to 1999 when we have 15 member states, we have 28 member states now, and these deals have to be ratified by the member states. You sound confident that you will be able to defend EU and indeed Irish agricultural interests? Well, you can assure you that I will be defending the European Union's agricultural interests in both those negotiations. Finally, Commissioner, then, on the issue of beef labelling, is something because the differential in the gap between uh, Britain and Ireland has closed recently, it's not as much of an issue as it was, but the reality of life is that once an animal leaves the Republic of Ireland and goes either north of the border or into Britain, it loses its identity, it becomes this awful thing called a nomad. Is there any way that beef labelling can be reviewed or reconsidered that the country of origin of an animal can be retained in some way or another to prevent this situation? Because it does clearly, when the trade opportunities there cost farmers money. Well, as you know, this matter was discussed at length before I arrived in the position as uh, Agriculture Commission, and then there were decisions made shortly before my arrival, and I don't see this particular subject being visited again in the short term. I understand the difficulties, uh, particularly in the island of Ireland, uh, but I, I, I would not envisage that Commissioner Andrew Kaisis is, in, is supposing to reopen this particular file in the short term. Do you see a country of origin level have been extended further along the chain into dairy and various other projects has been, as has been mooted in many quarters in recent months? Well, we have a voluntary scheme at the moment for dairy, and it's up to countries if they wish to use it. Uh, France has been pushing, of course, for mandatory labelling uh, and so and supported by Italy. But if it is to happen, it will be happening on a temporary basis to get over the crisis that we have in many of our com- in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the dairy area. But I think there will be a general reluctance overall because by many other member states because they will actually want to protect the internal market and the single market uh, measures that are there at the moment. Commissioner, thank you very much for your time. You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Meanwhile, our agribusiness editor, Owen Lowry, joined an Irish trade mission to Iran, which is opening up to trade as international sanctions are lifted. There he interviewed Helen King, Director of Consumer Insights with Borbia. We hear about the 80 million people that are in this market. What are their eating habits like? What foods do they eat to give maybe farmers at home an insight into what they're, what they're doing? Well, food is very central to their lives. They spend an awful lot of time cooking. It's part of a way of bringing families together and connecting and, and socialising. So they eat an awful lot of meat. Uh, we've been here a few days now. Uh, roasted lamb, uh, lamb kebab, very big. Um, I believe they eat an awful lot of chicken as well. We've come across lemon chicken dishes. Um, all of their dishes are spiced, not not heavily spiced, but they use uh, saffron and uh, turmeric, and you know it's a plenty full of spices. So a lot of meat, also a lot of dairy. Yeah, what what dairy products? We we spent yesterday out in the supermarkets. I suppose what did we see? Um, you know, that would indicate what their eating habits are in relation to dairy. So we've seen a lot of fresh milk, we've seen yogurts. Uh, they drink a lot of liquid yogurt, quite different to, to what we have. It's a liquid yogurt called dough. Uh, it's often fragranced with different spices. It's very refreshing. When you first drink it, it's quite uh, stark on the palate, but it's something that they drink as part of you know, every meal and also in the evening there's no alcohol here so it's one of the things that they would drink as part of their celebrations as well. It, they, seemed, it seemed to dominate the sh- some of the, a good few of the dairy yeah. can, uh, shelves yesterday yeah. um, and I also noticed that it was um, carbonated or fizzy. Yeah, it's, it is, it's a carbonated yogurt drink. It sounds a bit strange but after you take a few gulps of it, just, you get used to it. it. It's not something that we would be accustomed to, but it's, it's heavily fragranced with different, these, uh, different spices or um, citrus. 
And another uh, thing that I noticed is, okay, while they have liquid milk, uh, butter didn't seem to be very dominant on the shelves here. It's not a big market for butter, particularly so. Well, when we look at the statistics, it seems that butter is quite large. But I'm assuming that that's mostly ingredients because we haven't seen butter in the supermarkets much. And what we have seen is very small sections in the supermarkets and they tend to be uh, much smaller um, weights. Yeah. Um, so they, they do use butter on rice, but given the, the statistics, you would think they use an awful lot of butter, but I think that's probably more in manufacture and production. And then finally, just on the cheese, um, I suppose we're a cheddar cheese producing country. Um, I didn't see much cheddar on the shelves yesterday. No, I did actually see one Irish cheddar on the shelves yesterday, and that was from Glen Stahl. It was a, a, a white cheddar and a, a red cheddar, but very small. Um, you know, they have an awful lot of um, Gouda and uh, soft cheeses, the mozzarellas, the feathers. Um, a little bit different to what we would be accustomed to. So again, the real opportunity, I suppose, is for some of the more artisan producers to, and the cheese market initially, and maybe some of the bigger producers to supply into the dairy ingredient sector here, because I believe that it has a strong manufacturing footprint here. The indigenous food, man food producers are strong. Uh, again, we see a lot of strong food brands. Um, so I suppose that's an opportunity for Irish uh, dairy um, ingredient companies or processors. Yeah, absolutely. There should be a good opportunity here. And when everything that we've eaten tends to be heavily covered in cheese as well. So they use an awful lot of cheese uh, in their ingredients. And then on the retail side, while it's different cheese, there perhaps, as you say, an opportunity for the blue art cheeses or artisan cheeses that are somewhat different uh, this market. And do they eat the same set of meals, breakfast, dinner, uh, a lunch and a dinner in the evening or have you seen any of your research? I understand that um, they drink a lot of milk at their breakfast yeah. and then they, they move to the yogurt type drinks for the beverage yeah. Yeah. at lunch and dinner. And one of their breakfast dishes is quite unusual. It's a boiled sheep's head or cow's head. It's a stew and it takes hours to cook. Um, it's not something that in modern uh, Tehran or maybe more so in the regional areas they're doing it but it's something that you would find in the bazaars the food markets in the bazaars and um, they do take a lot of pride in their cooking certainly outside of the urban areas women would get up at 5 a.m or 6 a.m and start cooking for their midday meal which is their big meal so outside of the cities there's still a siesta type tradition where shops close during the midday during the heat People go home, they have their large midday meal, and then they would um, perhaps take a nap and then go back to work in the evening. So, um, you know, food is a big part of that culture. Well, look, thanks very much, Helen, for speaking with me. Um, I believe now you're going to investigate the food markets on the streets of Tehran. The Irish Farmers Journal Weekly Podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Back home, it's now clear that children are a key part in the campaign for farm safety. The Health and Safety Authority recognised this on Wednesday with an award ceremony for the best school projects promoting safety on farms. My colleague Amy McShane was there and she met the overall winner, Shane Farley from Baileyborough Community School in County Cavan. Shane, congratulations. Tell me a wee bit about your entry. Thanks, and it's a maze game. You play as a farmer and you have to get to his house at the end of every level and every level a new danger or obstacle gets added. In between these levels there's a slide which describes these dangers and obstacles and they tell you how to avoid them and they have percentages like fatalities or injuries. It just helps you learn every level you play and there's new characteristics of every level. The last level is a timer. It helps you learn. It's good for all, nearly all age groups. And making a game, an interactive game, must be quite difficult. Yeah, it was hard to get it exactly the way I wanted it. There are still some little minor issues that I couldn't really fix but it didn't really affect gameplay at all. And you're from a farm yourself so do you think that made you understand better the importance of farm safety? Yeah, my father, he is mad into farm safety. He doesn't do anything unless everything is properly safe. He helped me with all of the safety issues and he told me stories about people who didn't make sure they were safe. I got a lot of inspiration for the game from that. In terms of statistics, farms is one of the most dangerous workplaces. How important is it to get the message out there of farm safety? Well, it's nearly vitally important. The amount of people that die on farms is unnecessary. We should be able to get this information and everybody should be listening to us. They should be taking in the advice that has been given to them constantly in like ads or TV or radio. They should be acknowledging this information and we need to get that information everywhere so there will be no more unnecessary deaths or injuries. Shane, thank you very much.
And now I'm joined with Pat Griffith, who was head of the judging panel for the awards. Pat Shane Farley won in the end. Why did you go for him? Well, I think it's probably the most creative of them all, and it really gets kids involved with farm safety. They have to go into the game and actually go through a maze and avoid the risks that are often seen on a farm, such as moving machinery and livestock. So it absolutely hit all the buttons. I think it can be developed, and I think we can use it. And going forward, it could be a huge resource for us to try to sell the message to kids. So that's really why he won it. It's really, really creative development. And for the relevance to farm safety specialist section, sure chance it won it. That can be the attitude. Yeah, the, the catchphrase, sure chance it, I think is probably something that many farmers say on a daily basis. And on that basis, we really wanted to put it out there and try to change that approach, where farmers will actually decide not to chance it, will take a step back, even for a moment, and decide to do something different that might protect themselves or their families. And it really was a very, very catchy line. We had to use it, and I think we will be using it in the future. Ah, thank you very much. We hope that you're enjoying this Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. Find out more at farmersjournal.ie. Odile Evans continues her series on locally led agri environmental schemes and visits the Blackstairs Mountains this week. There she met three members of the Blackstairs Farming Group who were putting the scheme together. Coordinator Helena Fitzgerald, Chairman Martin Shannon and Vice Chairman Thomas McCarthy. Initially it started by Blackstairs farmers and people from the Blackstairs uh, attending a number of conferences and events to try and learn a bit more about locally, locally led approach but also to understand a bit more about how uplands and upland farming is viewed and um, I suppose that led us to high nature value farming. Yeah. Um, and that really was a game changer because high nature value farming values upland farming, and it says that upland farming is is more important or is is more important now really for the ecosystem services it delivers and for the meat that are produced. Like meat, the grazing is fundamental to the system, but economically, um, it, it's no longer sufficient to sustain hill farming, and that the balance is tipping towards the you know, the, these ecosystem services, the public goods, so the, you know, the beautiful landscape, the high levels of biodiversity, um, the high levels of water quality mm. um, that, that these landscapes deliver. So there's been a 50% reduction in the number of farm holders under the age of 44 sure. in the Blackstairs area since <coughs> 1991. Well, what do you think has driven that? I suppose lack of, lack of uh, I suppose, getting married and raising families and so on, I think, myself, would you agree with Moss? You know, people um, haven't, the older people haven't married much. Probably income and income. maybe a lot of the younger people in them years went building. Mm. Mm. Left, the, left, left the, in yeah. the ni- late 90s into, and, mm. and up to 2007 or 8, sure. And nearly every farmer's son was involved in building mm. somewhere or other. You know? I suppose unless something is done in realisa- the realisation of um, our um, governments of the day and so on have to come in and, and sustain, because it's all vital to the, you know, tourism is a big thing around the mountains and so on, as you well know. And unless people, you know, come up to the table and show an interest to keep people in these areas, yeah. there's going to be nobody there. You'll, you'll drive through and that'll be a harm to because tourism is one of the biggest industries in the country, as you well know. You have to keep it valuable. Yes, keep the whole thing and keep the hedges trimmed and the drains cleared and the various things that farmers have been doing and continue to do. And the mountains grazed. And the mountains grazed. We we had our our survey done in the mountain, as Helena was saying, and our mountains in the Black Stairs are in in good condition. But that that won't stay that way if farmers don't be kept in in these areas and to maintain this. There's big problems, sure, with dog control and all this, you know, how it comes dog to the fore. Yeah. And uh, these issues a lot burning, have to be burning. Burning, burning issues mm. and, and um, stock of densities and different things with glass and a lot of major problems on the hill in yes. the farm and other things. We're in a real agricultural heartland here. Yeah. And if agriculture isn't doing well, our economy isn't doing well. Mm-hmm. And it's been in, in decline, well, definitely, like since the 1970s. If we get support and help that's required now mm-hmm. before it is too late, because mm-hmm. when it's too late, the horse is gone, you know. Yeah. And younger farmers like the moss will continue to farm and younger again, you know. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah. So, yeah. well, that's what you'll be looking at. Yeah. And, and that's on the positive side. And if you don't look for something positive in anything, little point in bothering your head at all. Our concern, again, on a broader level, is that if these are pilots meant to inform the new cap 
post-2021, mm-hmm. we're running out of time to test these pilots to um, shape the new cap. Yeah. So uh, I suppose we, we would really be wanting to see the Upland Peats measure rolled out sooner. You're listening to the Irish Farmers Journal podcast, brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy. While the TDs in the Dáil are still dithering about the formation of a new government, a man in County Tipperary has decided to form a new political party to bring attention to rural issues. My colleague Anthony Jordan met Andrew O'Halloran at the first meeting of the Community Party. What we're having here tonight now is uh, the very first uh, inaugural meeting of the proposal for a new rural Irish political party focusing on communities, rural Ireland and the rural issues and stuff, uh, rural towns, rural villages, rural communities that have uh, been decimated over the last number of years. And we're number one, we're trying to protect them and number two, then we're aiming to develop them and, and secure them for generations to come. What was the inspiration behind it? When did you when did the idea form in your head and when, when did you really get the ball rolling on this project? Uh, the idea came to formally formation uh, in relation to our local GB service here in Bansha in October of 2015. Uh, the doctor that was there retired on health grounds and the HSC and the Department of Health were in a position where they were closing the surgery and the community stood up and we led the campaign against the closure of it and thankfully in the last couple of days we've had a successful outcome by securing a full-time position, five-day service, full-time doctor. When you see what's going on in the moment with uh, with rural Ireland and how people are saying a big thing is that people are saying it's, it's declining all the time, where do you see, um, what are the projections in your eyes, where can we improve in rural Ireland, what is it that we can do to benefit rural Ireland in the future? Uh, we need to start investing big time, we need to start investing in infrastructure, we need to start investing in schools, we need to start investing in roads and um, by bringing larger companies to, you know, we're not looking for a company, we're not looking for jobs in every single village and back road of Ireland, we're looking for uh, the major towns in each county to have some sort of um, employment for the people in the hinterland and that that's sustainable and that supports the community as well. Has the government of, of the day or, or of yesterday and the government before them, have they abandoned rural Ireland in a way? Uh, clearly they have because uh, Fine Gael's message going forward for the last election was uh, let's keep the recovery going. Uh, those inside of the M50 in Dublin did not see any recovery so they admitted that themselves that that was a, a wrong um, tagline to use for their campaign. Uh, yeah, rural Ireland has been left in the wilderness, you know, has been left behind um, and I think it's time now that something was done before it's too late. Would it be fair to say maybe that the fact that Ireland was going through a recession in 2011, how things maybe were were, were very poor um, in Ireland around that time, that it was important to stimulate the core of the economy, that being Dublin, before we were to stimulate the rural uh, parts of the economy? Uh, well, you, 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 they looked at it from that point of view, but, you know, recovery must be equal, you know, uh, everyone in the country you know the recession affected every corner of Ireland and you know every person in every corner of Ireland was 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 there for when when the banks needed bailing out every person ba- bailed the banks out but when it came to the actual recovery and the, the government's focus um, they completely forgot about rural Ireland and they focused as you said on uh, on Dublin and that was it. In terms of uh, the future of of, of, uh, of the Irish Community Party where do you see it where do you see it going where is the projections in the next few months? Well Grow, growth is the first thing is to get the message out of that we are in existence and what we're, what we're about uh, we're going to form a core of people who are very dedicated to it therefore from there then we're going to take it and we're going to sit down and we're going to look at policies and put policies in place that we feel um, we're not going to do short term we're going to do long term um, we're going to aim then for local elections in three years time so we're going to identify people in particular areas that are interested in running on, under the heading of our community uh, role party our community role party and we will then uh, bring them on board and build it from there and hopefully within a couple of years we'll have a number of councillors sitting councillors and hopefully we may recruit a few that are independent at the moment the irish farmers journal weekly podcast brought to you by Ornua, the home of irish dairy Finally, if you were among the 100,000 people who rushed to get health insurance to beat the lifetime community rating charge just one year ago, your policy is now up for renewal. Consumer editor Kira Leahy has advice on the process in this week's Irish Country Living and she tells Mary Phelan what you should look out for in your health insurance package. On Friday, April 30th, 2015, which is just uh, just about a year ago, phone lines and health insurance companies across the country were absolutely jammed as thousands of people made the desperate call to secure health insurance before that the close of business that day. If they had left it even one more day, if they had left it until May 1st and they were over the age of 35, they would be faced with loadings on their premium due to this lifetime community rating. And the level of loading depends on your age, but the older you are, basically, the more you are going to pay. Um, well, 
we're a year later, which means that all those people that were ringing those phone lines are up for renewal this weekend. So it is a very timely article. And how many actually signed up ahead of that deadline? About 100,000 people actually signed up for health insurance last year ahead of this deadline. Now, it's interesting. About half of them, about 50,000 people, opted for good quality plans. I suppose many of those people might have been older people that said, look, we did well for ourselves, not having health insurance for so long. Now we're buying in. We might as well get a good package. The remaining 50,000 people opt for, opted for lower level plans. Now, about half of those people did so because of financial limitations. They just wanted to get that they just want to get the minimum level of co- cover get on that health insurance ladder and you know that was fine that's what they selected the other half about 25,000 people selected those plans in haste. These were the people who last year were left to the last minute who couldn't get through because the phone lines were so jammed. They just went online got the cheapest plan but never actually really did a, a review of or even get good advice on it and there's a good actually, there's a good chance Mary that they actually have no idea what they bought. Now that this weekend is here and they, it's up for renewal this is what this article is about. It's about telling these people like you know it's important to really look at what's involved or uh, what's included in your um, health insurance p- package. But for the most part, they chose the cheapest plans. So, I mean, from their point of view, that's a good thing. But what do you see as the main problems with not doing their proper research? There's nothing wrong with going with the cheapest plan if you know what you're what you're getting into. That's absolutely fine. Um, but I suppose it is good to point out that the cheapest plan isn't necessarily the best value plan. Um, these plans really only covered the bare minimum. They've been stripped bare, really, and just about meet the regulatory requirements. So we're talking about no private hospital care, for example, minimum maternity benefits, um, no private MRI cover, and, you know, trying to get money back on routine visits, forget about them. They're not even a factor in it. As I said, if you want this this cover and you know all that, that's fine. You know where you stand. The problem is where people who don't know these details and then if something goes wrong and they're caught out. So for example, I interviewed Dermot Good um, from Total Health Cover and he said recently he had a client who rang him up saying his wife is expecting a baby in August and he just realised that they don't have proper maternity cover on their plan and they can't do anything about it because even if they get a better policy tomorrow, they won't be able to reap the benefits of that upgrade for um, at least a year. So Kira, if you're thinking of upgrading, what kind of money are you looking at? What what will they have to spend to bring their package up to meet their requirements? So Mary, if you were to look at prices, okay, you're going to be spending for an entry level plan, you're going to be spending about 450 a year per adult, about 1,000 euros, 1,050 euros for a family. Compare that to going for a mid level plan. Uh, for an adult, it's going to cost you about 800, 800 and 50 euros a uh, family you're looking at about 1800 1900 euros what's the difference you're going to get access to all public pu- public and private hospitals i mean some even co- cover major heart surgeries in the high-tech hospitals such as blackrock clinic and matter private and um, if you want to go up again you're looking at about 1200 euros per adult and that's where you're going to get cover for routine medical expenses such as gp physiotherapy dentist fees etc as i said at the very start it's up to you what you pay and obviously some people can't afford to pay 1200 euros a year per adult but it's very important to look at what's covered under entry level plan versus what's covered by going up a few a few hundred euros um you know it could be really worth your while in regards to value for money Thanks very much for that, Kira. Lots of great advice there. And for people who want more details, you'll find it in this week's Irish Country Living in the Farmers Journal. The Irish Farmers Journal podcast online at farmersjournal.ie, on the Irish Farmers Journal app, and on iTunes every Thursday. Brought to you by Ornua, the home of Irish dairy.